Welcome to Art Slice, a palatable serving of art history. I'm Stephanie Duenas. And I'm Russell Shoemaker. And welcome. Welcome, new listeners. If you're just joining us for the first time, we are an art history podcast. But we're like a we're like a cool art history podcast. We're not your mama's art history podcast. <laughs> what? We're cool. We're sitting behind chili lights. I mean, if you like, we would go to the museum with your uncle Fred, your uncle Fred, who hates art, and he they got you know he collects like vintage <laughs> uh, beer steins. What? <laughs> yeah, and he's like he's like the guy who walks around the museum, and he's and he's he's like going around, he's pinching the uh, the naked butts everywhere. <gasps> no. Yeah. Oh ew. yeah, and he's loving it too. He's like, Stop. he's like, ah. oh my god, he's taking selfies with the naked That's butts. That's disgusting. But what's that, Uncle Fred? He spots a vintage St. Pauli girl. Beerstein in the middle of an Edward Keenholz piece, and he is loving it. We might have changed his mind about art a little bit. So when he gets into his 1992 Honda Civic and drives <laughs> off into the sunset, it's time for us to get serious. Real talk. So we talk about the work and we decide if it goes in the Art Slice Museum, which Stephanie keeps telling me isn't real. It's, I mean, it's imaginary. No. Can I ask you a question? Um, uh, okay, I'm just going to ask you anyway. Okay. <laughs> what do you think of when I say witch? Witch? Mm-hmm. Sandwiches? Is that? No. Really? Sandwiches? And by sandwiches, I mean witches hanging out in the sand, like on a beach. Hanging out. They got their big black broomed hat, but they're kicking back. They're soaking up the sun. They're getting their tan on. I was they not aware little, they that. Drew, they drew a little like magic circle around them. All right, that was not the answer I was expecting. Uh, <laughs> That's what you asked me. I, you ask it, a question, you get a response. True, true. Okay, no. Let me rephrase that question. Okay, rephrase. Do you think if you saw Remedios Varro, Katsi Orna, and Leonard Carrington together out on the street, would you think they're witches? Would it occur to me that, the, well, okay, how many hyenas are with them? <laughs> First and foremost. Do they have like a black cat that talks on their shoulders? Do okay. they have like a an old timey soda fountain drink that they're sipping on pouring tequila in? Are they casting spells? You've got me. I I don't know. Okay. Am I okay? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, Elsie, she kind of has a a witch hairdo, like a witch hat hair. She has witch hat hair. So I might think she was a witch. Oh, like, even you know if, what? If I could see that. There. Yeah, like it looks like she stuck well, her... Because she usually wore it up on a, in a bun, in like a, a messy beehive. bun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looks like it was shoved in like that cone witch hat. And, and witches, <laughs> please, do not curse us. We know you don't wear those hats. I mean, it's cool if you do. I'm sure some some of you might. No, I guess the, the answer is I probably would... I would just think they were cool, cool ladies. Minus all the props. Oh, I'm sorry. They're not props. Those are real things. I if they had too many anybody. props, if they had like a hyena, if they had the cat that talked, if they had the witch hats on, I, I would probably think they're a little bit ridiculous. That's quite an image. But they I are just... surrealists. So I mean, surrealists were a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yes and no. So that was a complicated question. Just, I guess yeah. that was a complicated question to ask. You, you should know by now. I don't give straightforward answers. So you may not have known by just looking at them, but actually, Varro, Kati, and LC were very much into witchcraft. Okay. They would even go to the market and buy ingredients that they needed to make potions. I guess that would give them away after. <laughs> what kind they of market collected. has potions? Apparently, they would go to the Mercado de Sonora, the okay. market of Sonora. <laughs> the market of witchcraft. It, sure, famous. Uh, I guess, right? That's probably yeah. a secret Aisle code. 13, a couple cats you got to step over to get it. Black cats you got to step over to get to the aisle. That's what gives it away, right? The yeah. like, cluster of cats. And God around. forbid if you just are shopping for a broom and you accidentally stumble across that aisle. There is no color here per se. Okay, right. there's... No bold stars, no stripes, no red, white, or blue. But the essence of the flag is still there. It's just really stripped down. Right. It's almost like a magic eye image. If you remember those from being a kid, those printed images. It's like optical illusions. Yeah, yeah, that you'd have to get so close to and then you'd blur your eyes and all of a sudden an image of like a cat riding a skateboard would be there in front of you. I this mean, is <laughs> like that. You see you, except it's different. Like you don't blur your eyes. You stare at it for six hours and then you're like, oh, is that a flag? See, I was able to get close to no one mm -hmm. else was around. So I had it all to myself. Were you disappointed when you found out it was a flag? No, no. I think I was impressed. I was impressed at how he could take the American flag, a symbol that I know all too well, mm -hmm. and make it into something 
completely different. And now that I'm thinking about it, had I seen it from afar, enough for it to catch my attention, so I'm walking over to it, I read the plaque, and then I see it's it's supposed to be an American flag, and then I have an opinion already. I I would read the plaque and be like, oh, great. Like, what? What about the flag? And I would look at it and then just I just have this sense that maybe I was looking at something nationalistic. Mm -hmm. Like, is oh, great. Is Jasper Johns like super proud to be an American? Like, Mm -hmm. is this his painting showing off his pride? You know, I would have had I would have it could be. And that's fine. I would have had that layer. However, I would have missed out on enjoying this work. I would have missed out on forming my own opinion. I think it's important to have your own, right? your own thoughts and feelings about it. I mean, it, it's also just like, it, it helps that this is a beautiful piece. It's just so interesting to me. The paintings aren't. <laughs> like, as, as artworks, they're not that interesting to me. Conceptually, it's more interesting than the final image, but this is both. Right. This, is, this is very beautiful and vexing and foggy and, and just like, it has all this hidden meaning both literally it has a hidden symbol in it and figuratively it has a, it's just like a hidden meaning for for you to find yourself also for me the marks represent anxiety and mm-hmm. obsessiveness i agree it's the same mark mostly over and over yeah and the lack of color i think forces the viewer to think about the flag as a symbol and ask themselves what is the flag really you're not distracted by the colors. You're not distracted by the stars. The flag is just a bunch of shapes at the end of the day. But it's also beautiful to contrast that anxiety, that obsessiveness, that mark making with shapes, with just a bunch of shapes, because it shows you that that symbol does mean something. And I know Jasper isn't saying that literally. I'm saying this is what it means to me now. I have a lot of anxiety with America, <laughs> right. if I'm being honest with you. So seeing it like this reminds me not only that it's still a symbol but my interpretation of that symbol so first up in our double feature we will be discussing edvard munch's pastel tempera and oil paint on cardboard piece called (laughs) what the hell was that um Oh, I, I didn't cut. I had something cut out here on my in my headphones. Uh, wh- what was the piece we're talking about today? Today we're talking about the. Sp- <laughs> oh my god! What is happening? I'm sorry. There's. Uh, I'm getting some interference in my headphones. Do you think? I, one more time. I swear. This is the last time. You <laughs> this please is t- the last time. I yeah. swear. Edward Munch's. Yeah. The painting screen. entitled <laughs> the screen. <laughs> I'm feeling a combination of things right now, Russell. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am so confused. I can't make what I am and what I'm not. You never know what's behind that door. Is it a scream? (laughs) You know what? There's nothing I can do. Or underneath the table. It's just going to happen. What about there? No, that's that's just too many. But there is one. It was also probably very moving for young black children to see themselves in a work of art. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine like seeing yourself yeah. reflected in a sculpture? I would imagine that would be moving. Tap into that potential that everybody has, whether it's in the arts or not, whether it's just to stir someone to do something about the injustices that are going on, even if it means you're recognizing yourself in a sculpture. And if that's enough to get you to do something, then her work is done, right? Thinking about Augusta's life and just how much she had to fight for and go through, I also see this as a a protest piece. It's a protest anthem. Maybe that choir is singing a protest anthem, too, after they're done with Lift Every Voice and Sing. (laughs) Savage spent her life fighting for opportunities and rising above adversity, not just for herself, but for those she knew would come after her. She was aware she was sculpting the way for a new generation. Savage not only had to overcome adversity due to the color of her skin, but her life was also filled with the highs and lows that everyone faces. One example was being replaced as the director of the Harlem Community Art Center while she was preparing for the World's Fair, the art center that she had started. Eventually, she moved to upstate New York and faded out of the spotlight, still making work at her farmhouse. 
And while her monument, the harp, was never commissioned to be cast in bronze, it instead was swept away in the rubble of the World of Tomorrow monuments, Augusta was always looking forward. She knew that the World Fair's theme of a utopian tomorrow was all hype. She knew that her monument, like the harp, would not last forever. Her monument was in the change she spurred in her students so they too could continue the long journey of working towards change. Quote, If I can inspire one of these youngsters to develop the talent I know they possess, then my monument will be in their work. No one could ask for more than that. End quote. So with management and control out of the way, another theme is solidarity, Mm. right? So the other side of that coin. Right. Remember, Diego observed these workers. He spent hours at this plant making tons and tons of sketches of both the machinery and the workers. He was also observing closely how the workers were being mistreated. Besides for the machinery in these murals, the, the thing you'll notice the most are just how many workers there are. I think he's giving the answer by showing the workers just how many of them that there are in this factory. Well, the informants, the foremen, they're lost in a sea of workers. Yeah, Diego paints them in a sea of workers. I I think he's saying there's just so much potential here. There's potential to move past racial and class distinctions that this world has made up and connect with your humanity, just just your humanity. Well, just like the murals back in Mexico were telling the people Mm. that they could still identify with their pre colonial colonized spirit. And I think the gods that he he painted above the the factory murals, uh, you know, the ones with the raised fists, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's not a very veiled call for solidarity, <laughs> right? And I, I don't think Diego is saying that, you know, any of the, the solutions that he's proposing will be easy. Right. It's that duality once again. Yeah. He is also showing the workers uh-huh. what they're up against. But he's also showing them what they're capable of. Right. I mean, they're the ones powering this factory. They're p- powering that horrifying Aztec robot goddess. <laughs> (laughs) whether they like it or not. (laughs) It's like a mirror. They're so Mm. drawn into the work that they're doing, all of their repetitive motions, Mm -hmm. that they don't have time to see the full picture. exactly. That couldn't have said it any better. Diego is showing them the full picture. I mean, he's holding the mirror up to the factory. Look at it! Actually, what they were, and you're not going to believe this, Mm. they were illustrations for pharmaceutical brochures. Yeah, I, I don't believe you. For Casa Bayer. For Bayer. Bayer. The aspirin company. Wait, wh- 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 what? These are pharmaceutical ads? Thank you. In the yes. 40s? They needed drugs back then, too. Like, um, what would you think if you saw, like, if you went to Target <laughs> and you, you need your ibuprofen and then you see a guy getting stabbed by porcupine quills? I mean, that's the one I'm buying for sure. <laughs> oh, my God. But, like... No, you know what I'm thinking? I don't think this was for the average person. I think like these are brochures for like wholesale. I'm still confused because I I don't know if I like, saw this. No, like you as the customer are going to see it. Like the person who buys the drugs for like Target is going to see it. That person. Okay. What the drug peddler is going to stop by with their brochures. You're not going to see it. The 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 person in charge Felicia, of Felicia, we're almost out of them. Uh, I forget the names of them. The one with the, the mummified man getting stabbed by the by the porcupine quills. We need some more of those drugs. We're all empty. They're, they're flying off the shelves. While you're at it, order some more of those disembodied eyes floating around. We need some more of those. We need some more of those too, Felicia. Okay. They're pretty convincing, I have to say. She's doing a pretty good job. Okay. She did work for them for a few years. So I'm, sure I'm a visual learner, Felicia. I just remember pictures. I don't what not me remember the words. How did I get in this position to be ordering drugs for people in Mexico City? I don't know. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I was very curious to see where this would go. All right. Love it. But there is a bit of uneasiness, though. Yeah. The unusual, closely cropped composition throws you into the movement. All of the movement and the colors go right to the edge of the paper, mm-hmm. right? There is no breathing room. There's no place for your eyes to rest. It's almost anxiety inducing. And it's amplified by the echoing shapes that are like almost battling. They're almost like firing at one another, right? Yes. There's a kind of spookiness, too, like on top of all of that. The house, this little house, it's kind of almost disappearing behind all of these crazy shapes and colors. 
it may have been our only symbol of normalcy, right? Like, oh, that's our anchor, right? But it's not an inviting house. I don't want to go no. into that house. It's like a Hansel and Gretel house, right? <laughs> and I think there's like a green monster it outside does. the door, yeah, yeah, blocking yeah, yeah. the door maybe. Like, you can't come in. You must face the rain. Maybe I don't want to face the rain. But those flowers, right? The flowers that are right in front of the house, their little faces are just like scrunched. And like, maybe they know something. We don't know. Maybe <laughs> nature knows something. We don't know. It's just that feeling of not belonging, right? You're straddling the border between, like, what the hell does being American even mean? Yeah, what what is America? Is it something Something you even want to be? Is it something that you would even be proud of, right? Or am I Mexican? This culture is familiar to me, right? Having gone there growing up and then just being around family. But Mm. I have bits and pieces of it. But I grew up thinking, where do I fit in? But you're a million things. Mm. You're complex, right? But I understand having lived in so many places other than my home town that there's just a time where you just feel like you're neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even have to come down to race or ethnicity necessarily, but just feeling like an outsider, generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally get that. And Frida experienced that loneliness too. And she was also like all kinds of dualities and she embraced that as well. It sounds like she was experiencing a lot of what you're saying. And she was on the border of so many different things. She was bi. She was biracial. Like her dad was from Germany and her mom was Mexican. She actually was a little bit androgynous. She was just like fluid like that, complex like that, which most people are, but she was just totally open about it Mm -hmm. in the 1930s. 1930s, Right. So, but she embraced it. She embraced it all. And yet she's still feeling like she's straddling a border. Well, do you you want my white guy opinion about the work or? (laughs) Yes. All opinions welcome. Unless they're rude, then no. Uh, This this piece is is going in the museum for me. Totally. Easily. It's not as strong as her other work craft-wise, but that's really not an issue for me. Mm-hmm. We have to remember, first of all, Frida is still learning how to paint here while she's, you know, doing some bangers like yeah. that. Uh, Luther, <laughs> what's his name? Luther Burbank. Luther Burbank. Burbank. She is painting on these tiny tin retablo pieces. Like, she's emulating retablo works. Right. And it's interesting. You can see how this artist couple is influencing one another. Mm-hmm. And Steph and I, like, we influence one another when we work, of course. Yes. Um, but Diego, he was modernizing frescoes. You know, frescoes right. is this really old way of working and retablos are a really old way of working and Frida is modernizing those. Mm. She's not using those spiritual stories, right? Right, neither is Diego. Yeah, neither is Diego, exactly. She's putting in her own pain. She's putting in her own belief system into these works and the fact that she's hiding all that content in these tiny retablo paintings, it makes them super duper deadly. So if you're used to seeing these things, if you're used to seeing retablo paintings in like Mexico, let's say, or Stephanie, like how many murals have you seen in your life? A lot. How many have you been bored by? A lot. Right. So even <laughs> so, like even if they have some interesting content and they're not just like trying to sell lofts in the Castro district. <laughs> right. So Diego using that medium and then injecting his own like communist belief system that he's trying to like <laughs> yeah. change people with, it makes it deadly. And Frida taking those religious retablos mm-hmm. and putting her own pain and honestly activism into them makes them just as deadly as yeah. Diego's work, but they're in a much smaller package. That's funny that you say that because if you recall André Breton, the leader of the Surrealist movement yeah. in Paris, he actually saw Frida's paintings and he said that they looked like a ribbon wrapped around a bomb. <laughs> so you're like, oh, pretty. And you get up there and then you're just blown to smithereens. You're blown away. No. That's the thing about Frida. She lays it out there, right? And you have to read the fine print. And the fine print here is actually pretty obvious. It's like in red. And it's like, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of a medicine ad, right? They're telling you all the good things about it. <laughs> and then at the end, it's like... <gasps> Like all these things could happen to you. All of these side effects could affect you. Ask your doctor if capitalism is right for you. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Would he even have wanted that on a wall, on display? Maybe not. I think it was for him. You might be right. He's working through it. I'm not Van Gogh, but I wouldn't want my studies out on a wall. True. I think this was for him. I think it shows that he's human, though. I think we we talk these artists up, at, you know, in museums everywhere you go. These these are these are geniuses. Van Gogh's like br- a brilliant genius, a misunderstood genius whose yeah. life is too short, right? Yeah. And we don't fully understand the vulnerability of artists as they learn and as they find their footing. I think most people who walk into a museum just think 
oh shit, these these people are just born with it. They're not, they're not like coming out of the womb like able to draw like Michelangelo or whatever. Right. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they, they stumble, they like hit their toe in the dark, you know? Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think it's nice to see that they're human. And really what separates somebody like Van Gogh is that they they keep an investigative mind open. They look at the world around them. They let influence kind of wash over them. And they, they process that influence and they let it change them. They don't steal. They process. I feel really bad. Why do you feel bad? Because. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. No, I know you're not. I'm just like, well, no, well, now I'm like trying to walk back what I said. But at the same time, I don't. Do museums consider what the artist would have wanted? Would, would Van Gogh have wanted this piece out on display? I probably wouldn't want mine out. He probably wouldn't, but I think if he heard you say what you just said, he'd be like, okay, yeah, this might inspire someone Mm -hmm. to not be afraid to struggle, not be afraid to be vulnerable, to be open-minded and be okay with making mistakes because it's going to lead you to make better work. So you have to see them from far away. The churchgoers. What are they called? The congregation. (laughs) The congregation, they're not going to be able to get up close and like check out the deets. But with this work, you kind of have to get up close. You got to zoom in or you're going to miss the good stuff. These were figures and deities that lived in her short stories, in her reality and through a house opposite. She's made them just as important to her as biblical figures and saints are to Christianity. Yeah. So in Christianity, mostly men are part of the story. And this is a house full of mostly women. (laughs) We think there are a lot of androgynous figures. That's true, that's true. In Christianity, the few women that are included are either evil or sinful. Eve or or Lilith. Or Mary Magdalene. But in Elsie's world, it's the opposite. (laughs) You get it? (laughs) Well, it is opposite. She yeah. includes she includes characters that she made up as a child, which, you know, can range from animals, humans, to objects. She's given cabbages feelings. Yeah. <laughs> Making them fight. Fight yeah. cabbages. In Elsie's world, there's nothing outside of the realm of possibility. It's peaceful. It's harmonious. It's strange looking and odd. Yes. But it's oddly comforting. Yeah. It's almost like, oh, it's weirdly like Shintoism in a way. Everything having a soul. Everything having a purpose. Every object Every, has yeah. a purpose and we're thankful Valuing for it. Even if you're eating it. Even if you're eating the egg tofu chickens. Her friendship with Kati and Varo, you can tell they're they're creating a home. You can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. Exactly. Who can then become your family. She found her weirdos for sure. <laughs> so the house opposite is the place that the three witches strive to create and strived to thrive in. And I think they did both. So it's going in the museum, I guess. Yes, okay. absolutely. Cool. What about for you? I'm not sure I wanted to be in the museum. I think I wanted to be the museum. Hell yes. <laughs> Hell <laughs> Like I want that yes. warm feeling, that, that, that lovey feeling, that feeling of caring for one another, that feeling of camaraderie. The feeling of a, an accepting home. Yeah, of an accepting home, of interesting people doing interesting things, taking care of one another. Chickens hopping into cauldrons to be eaten with a smile on their stupid little chicken faces. <laughs> Thanks for showing it to me. Shoot. Yeah, that's way better. <laughs> Let's do some magic and make that happen, huh? Let's do it. All right. <laughs> 